Good morning, everyone, uh, or good afternoon. My name is Nancy Lynn. I'm the president of the U.S. Institute of Peace, and I'm delighted to welcome you uh, this morning for yet another in our bipartisan congressional dialogue series. I'm pleased to have with us two congressional leaders, Congressman Ed Case from Hawaii, uh, who is with us now, and Congressman Ted Yoho from Florida, who will be joining us in just a few moments. And they are here to talk this morning about the next era of U.S. Pacific Islands engagement. Um, and what I especially love about this series, and I'm so pleased to have both of them join us this morning, is that it really enables us to highlight the importance of bipartisan problem solving, especially when it comes to tackling important foreign policy challenges, which is exactly what brings us here today. The United States has long historic ties to the Pacific Islands, and that includes U.S. territories and independent countries. Um, but for many decades, this region has taken a backseat to a lot of other concerns. This is starting to change. Uh, we're seeing U.S. policymakers, members of Congress, uh, and many other countries increasingly pay more attention to the region. And the U.S. has wide-ranging interests in the area from uh, governance to climate issues to fisheries. But China's recent diplomatic and economic push into the region has focused attention within the U.S. administration, which has recently expanded high-level diplomacy and taken steps to increase development and security assistance and promote people-to-people -people ties. In the past two years, Australia announced a Pacific step-up policy and New Zealand launched a Pacific reset. Interest has also been rising in Beijing, Tokyo, Jakarta, and other capitals. So last year, Representative Case and Representative Yoho joined with some of their colleagues to form the Congressional Pacific Islands Caucus to educate members of Congress and their staff about the importance of the Pacific Islands demonstrate U.S. commitment to the region, facilitate communication and cooperation between the U.S. and Pacific Islands, and aid in the development of a sound national policy in this important part of the Indo-Pacific. So altogether, we're seeing levels of focus on the Pacific Islands that haven't existed since the end of the Pacific War in 1945. Um, we last hosted Congressman Case uh, just over a year ago, I believe, in the USIP headquarters uh, for a discussion on the Indo-Pacific region. So I'm delighted to welcome him back on what is now our virtual platform. And we're also pleased to have Congressman Yoho join us to share his insights uh, from his position as a ranking member of the House Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on Asia, the Pacific, and Non-Proliferation. Congressman Case represents Hawaii's first district, which given its location on the Pacific, has a vested interest in the economic and security stability of Asia and this region. And his district is also home to the US Indo-Pacific Command. Congressman Yoho represents Florida's third district, which includes Gainesville, parts of Northeast Florida. He has been a leader uh, in promoting effective and sustainable US global engagement strategies especially through the Development Finance Corporation. So each of them brings rich expertise in the US, to the US Pacific uh, relations issues and broader, the broader arena of international affairs. Um, in just a moment, Congressman Case will offer remarks. Uh, we hope we'll be joined uh, by Congressman Yoho, who's been detained on the Hill uh, for his comments. And then after that, I'll ask a question or two uh, and then take questions from our online audience. So viewers uh, can participate in the live Q&A using the YouTube chat box, box, box function uh, on the YouTube page. And please join the conversation using uh, on Twitter using the hashtag BipartisanUSIP. Um, with that, Congressman Case, welcome back. Um, delighted to have you and I'll turn things over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Nancy, and uh, good morning, Anna Fan. Uh, aloha to everybody that is, uh, that is watching in today. Um, it's um, really great to be back with USIP. As, as you noted, I was uh, privileged to, to uh, be with you a year ago with my uh, friend and colleague, John Rutherford from Florida, 
were colleagues on the Appropriations Committee, and we had actually just returned from a congressional delegation with the Appropriations Committee to Asia, the Pacific, uh, fascinating uh, trip. Uh, first time for some folks on that Codel. I've spent a lot of time in the Asia and the Pacific over my life, um, but uh, that was a great uh, discussion that we had, as you mentioned, on the Indo-Pacific, but really focusing on China continues to be a very topical discussion, of course. Um, and this year, I'm really honored to share the stage with uh, Ted Yoho, who will be with us uh, shortly, who's just been a really stalwart uh, uh, member of Congress on, on our foreign policy with a focus on uh, Asia Pacific uh, through his through his uh, uh, ranking membership on the um, House Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on East Asia and the Pacific. So it'll be great when he joins us. And I would be remiss, Nancy, if I didn't uh, recognize you and the great work you've done for uh, USIP. Um, and I wish you uh, every every uh, best uh, fair winds and following sea as you go forward, speaking mm -hmm. of the Indo-Pacific. Um, I'm really happy today to spend a little time with Ted on, as Nancy mentioned, on a, on a part of our world with, which the U.S. has been a part of for two centuries plus now um, in many different ways, shapes, and forms. And yet um, we don't really talk enough about the Pacific Islands, which have now been highlighted by, by many things that are happening uh, in our world. And when we talk about the Pacific Islands, we're really talking about that incredibly vast area on the globe. If you take a look at a globe uh, that stretches all the way from from Rapa Nui, Easter Island on the east, which is a, which is a, a province of uh, Chile, uh, to Hawaii in the north, uh, to, to New Caledonia and Palau in the, in the west, and, and to the countries of, of the South Pacific, uh, encompassing the great areas really of Melanesia, Micronesia, and Polynesia. And uh, when you take a look on a map, you see ocean, but uh, when you dig down underneath it, um, if you take the land areas of these jurisdictions and their exclusive economic zones, and you take a look at that map of the land and the exclusive economic zones, there's a lot of overlap, and you come to an area of our globe that's larger than the land mass of Russia and China put together. So this is a huge area, uh, a huge uh, uh, area of jurisdiction for the collective Pacific Islands, which make up 24, 25, depending on how you define the Pacific Islands uh, jurisdictions. Uh, many, of course, independent countries, um, some of them in free association with some of the Pacific Rim countries, uh, the United States in free association with uh, the Republic of the Marshall Islands, the Federated States of Micronesia and the Republic of Palau. Uh, and then other parts of the Pacific Islands that are that are parts of other countries, for example, uh, the United States, uh, Hawaii, of course, uh, Guam, uh, the, the Northern Marianas, uh, American Samoa. So this is a huge uh, part of our, our world that in, encompasses a, a, an incredible, um, really um, common uh, values, common uh, history, common interests. Uh, the Pacific um, is, is um, all of our backyard, uh, so to speak, or front yard if you live in, in Hawaii, and this is this is an area that is increasingly critical uh, to our world. And as I mentioned earlier, from the United States perspective, uh, we are a Pacific country. Uh, when I'm here in Washington, which is 2,500 miles away from the Pacific Ocean and off the coast of California and 5,000 miles away from, from, from my home, um, sometimes you tend to see Eurocentrism or Atlantic centrism or Middle East. And of course, those are all incredibly important parts of our foreign policy. But when you take a look at the big picture of the world and where the real um, choices are being made in the world that are gonna determine not only the world's future, but especially our country's future, I would submit to you that that's the Pacific, the Indo-Pacific. Uh, the Indo-Pacific from, from the East Coast of um, Africa to the West Coast of, of the United States and everywhere in between is, is, is for us a critical area. We've been involved in this area for centuries now. The U.S. Navy, uh, first uh, the fledgling U.S. Navy coming into the, uh, the Pacific Ocean at the very beginning, uh, you know, whaling uh, such a rich history in, in, in the Pacific, which influenced many parts of the Pacific. Um, many of the great uh, religions of our world's outreach into the Pacific Islands with uh, lasting influence uh, to this day. Of course, the period of um, however you want to describe it, imperialism, manifest destiny, great white fleet, um, the United States' annexation of the Philippines and, and Hawaii for that matter in the late 1800s. Uh, World War II, of course, uh, an incredibly uh, difficult uh, enterprise uh, involving many, many countries uh, throughout the Pacific. Um, and, and of course, um, 75 years ago, just about next month, the end of that uh, war, but not of our not of our involvement. Uh, the United States continued on with many many countries. Uh, we actually had the trust territory of the Pacific Islands, 
uh, through the United Nations. Other countries also had trust responsibilities until in the 50s and the 60s, many of these countries struck out on their own and it forged their own identity. Um, and of course, we, our country, have alliances and friends throughout the region, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, who are very, very much involved in the Pacific Islands, as are we. And we have um, focused on the Pacific Islands uh, for the last uh, um, um, you know, 50 years, quietly, but steadily and in volume, $5 billion or so invested uh, over the last 10 to, 10, 10 to 20 years, major investments by uh, USAID, of course, the Peace Corps, one of the most successful enterprises in our country's history of outreach to other countries, very active in the Pacific Islands. Um, and the Pacific Islands have not been sitting here just interacting with us. They've been forging their own identities, their own regional uh, infrastructure, their own agreements, their own views about how, um, what their role is in the world and how to interact with the world. A large representation of the United Nations, for example, where they've uh, certainly been very, very um, influential. And so um, there's been a real um, kind of a, a a whole uh, series of events and, and interactions that have been going on. Um, but in all honesty, I think our policy towards the Pacific Islands has been a little haphazard, a little, a little um, um, you know, um, play, it, play it as we go, at least for the last uh, 10, 20 years. Maybe some of that is uh, understandable given our focus uh, uh, on, on other uh, critical uh, areas such as the war on terror and uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, but we now need to start to focus more directly on the Pacific Islands. We have not only old challenges of maintaining uh, economic uh, sustainability, but new challenges. Uh, the Pacific Islands themselves are at the forefront, uh, the, literally the forefront of climate change. And they have taken climate change more seriously than anywhere else in the world because it's a matter of survival uh, to them. Um, uh, economic development has been a critical uh, area for the for the Pacific Islands, uh, with aging infrastructure, uh, with the with the struggle to find uh, economic sustainability with an increasing population and, and limited resources. Uh, natural disasters, uh, COVID nineteen, where the Pacific Islands have done some of the best work in the entire world, uh, but at great cost uh, to their economies, mm -hmm. which are which are uh, in many cases uh, tourism reliant. And of course, uh, the expansion of China into the Pacific Islands and the question of what China's uh, real motives are and um, really presenting uh, many of the Pacific Islands with a very, very difficult uh, choice, um, which they don't want to be presented with. They, they want to interact with the rest of the world in, 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 a, in a way that, that will facilitate what they need for their peoples. And, and, I, and I believe in, in, in large part to advance uh, the values that, that, they, that they share with the United States and other members of the world who are looking for a, a free, democratic, uh, peaceful, um, interactive, uh, sustainable uh, world. Um, so the response um, has been, um, as I said, haphazard. Some of the best work in the Pacific Islands is going on actually through our military, specifically Indo-Pacific uh, Command mm -hmm. headquartered in Honolulu. Uh, Indo-PACOM interacts regularly with the Pacific Islands on a whole range of issues. Um, other parts of our country have been uh, overlooked. For example, the Coast Guard has, has done incredible work with the Pacific Islands in terms of trying to uh, enforce their exclusive economic zones, which are under threat from illegal and unreported um, uh, fishing extraction. Um, here in, 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 in my home state of Hawaii, uh, some of the foundations such as the East West Center at, uh, at, um, in Honolulu, uh, which has been working in the Pacific Islands for, for two generations now, along with the Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies, all very, very good uh, constructive uh, outreaches, but we think we need more than that from a, a country perspective. And so, as Nancy mentioned, uh, 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 Congressman Yoho and I and a number of others, uh, including uh, Brad Sherman of the Foreign Affairs uh, Committee, uh, Ami Berra, who is now the chair of the subcommittee on East Asia and the Pacific, as well as uh, Don Young, who is uh, also a Pacific a representative in Alaska and the senior member of, of the House uh, all came together to form the, the uh, Congressional Pacific Islands Caucus with a focus on the Pacific Islands. That's our desire, focus policy on the Pacific Islands. We're about to introduce our first uh, major uh, piece of legislation, which we refer to as the uh, Boosting Long-Term U.S. Engagement in the Pacific uh, Act. That's the Blue Pacific Act, if you want to remember it uh, in short. Uh, that's really a testament uh, to many of the ideas that have come out of the Pacific Islands nations themselves through the Pacific Island Forum. 
uh, where they said, look, this is this is the how we uh, would 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 welcome a, a an increased interaction with you, the United States. This is what we need. This is how you can help us. And so we really in the Blue Pacific Act are trying to tick off the areas that we think we can interact with on a constructive basis. Uh, they range from assistance on climate change, uh, uh, law enforcement, uh, maritime security, uh, critical to the Pacific Islands, uh, to uh, straight up economic uh, major increases in economic uh, development, which is what uh, uh, many of the countries need uh, the most, uh, to promotion of common uh, uh, values such as protection of women, gender identity, and on. Uh, we're gonna introduce this in the next couple of days. Uh, we're going to try to uh, uh, advance it as far as we possibly can um, in, in this Congress. And then if you know, we don't get there, we'll pick it up in the next Congress. But it serves not only as a, as a policy statement, but as a vehicle for this uh, discussion. The, the, um, the bill that we're introducing would, would um, carry with it um, significantly increased authorization for funding for all of these programs, somewhere in the range of a billion a year. Uh, which is roughly three to four times what we are spending in these areas uh, today. Um, so um, all very good. Um, I think, you know, there's a lot of work to be done. Um, we have, we're playing a little bit of catch up in the Pacific Islands, uh, but we want to catch up and, and um, um, be, be that full partner that we think we already are and we need to be going into the future of the Pacific Islands, recognizing their desire uh, to forge their own direction, their own identities. Uh, so, so this is this is about a true partnership, uh, you know, not about a return to 100 years ago or anything like that. Um, I think for us, um, I would conclude by just saying this. Um, I uh, told this story yesterday on on the phone with a number of uh, leaders from uh, from ambassadors from the Pacific Islands, um, which was a very very constructive uh, phone call. And I told them the story of talking with young leaders uh, in my office through a program sponsored by the East West Center, which is called the Pacific Island Young Leader Program or something to that effect. And I asked them all, what do you most want from the United States? What, what is it that's missing here? You know, tell me. And they said, just show up, just show up a little bit more. Uh, you know, we, we, we tend not to uh, show up enough. And so we're aiming to fix that in this, in this um, um, bill and in this caucus. And we're trying to, um, uh, you know, work with anybody that wants to work with us uh, towards the advancement of uh, the Pacific Islands broadly and um, the relationship of, of us and our allies and friends uh, with the Pacific Islands. So uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, share all of that with you. and. Uh, Happy, I hope I talked long enough for Ted to join us, but not quite. <laughs> well, let me let me start with a few questions. Thank you for that very thorough lay down um, and a, a bit of a historical sweep as well. Is this the first time that Congress has had a caucus focused on the Pacific Islands? Yes, this is the first Congressional Pacific Islands Caucus that's, uh, that's, that's been created. And, and just, just so folks uh, uh, do know, because sometimes we assume that everybody knows, so in Congress, a caucus is a collection of members of Congress that come together for a common purpose. That's what a caucus is. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of different kinds of caucuses. Uh, some of them are fairly um, uh, partisan, um, and some of them are <clears throat> very, very nonpartisan. It, it really depends on the issue, depends on the focus, depends on what the members of that caucus want to accomplish. Uh, so you, we have, for example, a, a um, Congressional Diabetes Caucus uh, for folks that want to focus on uh, cures for diabetes. We have a Congressional uh, <clears throat> um, uh, U.S.-Australia Caucus for those that want to focus on that relationship. And you know, I could go on and on and on. There's a fair number of caucuses, um, but this is the first time that we have focused exclusively on the Pacific Islands. Um, and there aren't, um, you know, there aren't hundreds of caucuses. There are maybe, I would say, 75 recognized caucuses. So this is a formal recognized caucus of, of, of Congress, uh, completely bipartisan. You will, you will take a look at the membership of our caucus. Uh, and there are, there are members of the caucus that um, I probably don't vote with very much, uh, but um, we have a common goal. And, and the members of the caucus um, come to the Pacific Islands Caucus for different reasons, but they're all motivated by the same overall goal, which is to increase focus. Uh, for some, it is a little bit more about uh, the great power competition with China. For some, it's a little bit more about, um, you know, the the um, um, the, the U.S. AID side. We've got members that, um, as I recall, who have served in the Peace Corps, 
uh, in the Pacific Islands or in the Indo-Pacific and have a special uh, place in their hearts for it. I think one or two members had, had, uh, had fathers that fought in the Pacific War and have carried that with them. So there's a lot of different reasons. It doesn't really matter. Everybody's there for the same reason. Well, you answered my question, which is, you know, obviously you uh, coming from Hawaii have a special connection to that region, but have you found it to be a harder sell uh, across the country? And I think you just answered that in part with that, that list of various interests. Well, um, um, a little bit to my earlier point, I think um, the, the goal of the caucus is to highlight uh, the Pacific Islands and our relationship with the Pacific Islands and to strengthen it. And so emphasis on highlight first, because I do find uh, coming from Hawaii and my, my family is uh, four generations uh, deep in Hawaii. So we've you know, we've been in the Pacific uh, for a long time. My orientation is is to the Pacific and, and to the West. Uh, that's my natural orientation. Uh, my constituency um, is is an is an Asia Pacific Islands constituency, not a not a you know uh, mainland United States constituency. Very very diverse uh, roots throughout the Pacific Islands. Uh, Eighty percent of my constituents are, are are their heritage lies somewhere in the Pacific, not in Europe. So um, for me, it's a natural orientation. But uh, again, coming to to, to Washington, um, that's not the natural orientation of Washington. You've you've, you've got to you've got to have a reason, or you have to care for some reason, or maybe you've you've you've, you've decided, as I have, that uh, from a from a pure national perspective, this is where our future is going to get charted. So you focus there, but. Um, you do need to highlight it, and uh, many of the areas that we've talked about, uh, members um, members are focusing on it for the first time, and that's good. You know, you you mentioned the role of the Pacific Islands in the UN, and collectively they do carry considerable weight there. Um, it, are are you looking at some of the ways that we can work more closely with the Pacific Island countries at the UN or other multilateral fora? Um, absolutely. I mean, I think that's critical to our to our overall um, um, role with the Pacific Islands is, is just engagement, engagement across the board. Um, uh, the, as I said earlier, the Pacific Islands have, have forged their own regional identity. They forged their own regional um, um, organizations where they they act collectively. Uh, they they have decided rightly. Uh, that when you are a collection of jurisdictions spread across a very vast ocean with uh, very limited resources, um, your your best your best um, approach to the world is collect is a collective approach, not not a go it alone approach. So they're very very much focused on it, and of course, um, you know they 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 have um, they have common concerns across the board. Uh, they have um, each of each of the Pacific Islands has its own distinct culture. Uh, Melanesia, Micronesia, and Polynesia have their own distinct uh, cultures, which you know archaeologists and anthropologists um, study all the time. And um, but you know collectively, the point being that that they they need to where they can act together. Um, and mm -hmm. I think that's exactly the right thing to do. And so our our role is uh, to, to respect all of that, to interact with their their chosen organizations, their chosen uh, fora. Uh, but also not to forget bilateral uh, uh, relationships, uh, because um, as one of the ambassadors on the phone yesterday pointed out, the question was asked of her, um, you know, would you prefer, you know, multilateral or bilateral? And she said bilateral. So she wants, you know, she wants the direct connection between uh, her country and the United States. And I, I don't think it's a choice that has to be made. The, 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 the decision is across the board, multilateral, bilateral, interacting with uh, you know, formal Pacific uh, organizations. Um, there are many uh, fora throughout the Pacific Islands uh, that that the United States shows up at sparingly, if at all. Uh, sometimes not even as a, as an observer to what the Pacific Islands regard as major um, collective organizations. So I think we need a little bit more focus from a from a you know from a from a representation perspective. Um, and of course, it always helps when when our Secretary of State actually does visit. Um, uh, the Pacific Islands, as he did, credit to him, and it does help when our president hosts members of the Pacific Islands community at the White House, as he did. Uh, so credit to him on that. So that kind of stuff needs to continue. And so you talk about the bilateral, multilateral, but what about the particular relationship with New Zealand and Australia, you know, who have long 
taken the lead on many of the issues related to the Pacific Island nations. Are well, we... our, our relationship with New Zealand and Australia and Japan, I would say, uh, uh, because people, um, people rec most people recognize New Zealand and Australia's engagement in, in the Pacific Islands, which has been uh, stellar. Uh, but they sometimes overlook Japan, which has also been stellar. Japan has been has been very active in in uh, in, in uh, assistance to the Pacific Islands. Japan has a huge foreign aid uh, budget, uh, one of the biggest in the entire world from a per capita perspective, and they've invested that in the Pacific Islands. Uh, and so, um, where they where they have their own ties, of course, uh, predating the war, uh, under a different history. Uh, but there's uh, still in parts of the Pacific Islands uh, quite an quite an influence uh, from Japan, and of course Japan um, has been quite engaged. And I think those uh, interactions with uh, New Zealand, Australia, and the Pacific Islands are are uh, and Japan uh, to coordinate our own interaction with the Pacific Islands is really critical. I think the only thing I would say along those lines is that um, if you listen to the Pacific Islands, sometimes how they feel about it is that. Um, that uh, the interaction is 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 more specific from a country to regional as opposed to each country to all. So, for example, um, the 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 the, um, the criticism would be that the United States tends to focus more on Micronesia uh, because we have much closer historical ties with Micronesia through the trust territory of the Pacific Islands, whereas we don't interact as much with uh, you know um, um, uh, Melanesia uh, because. Um, you know, New Zealand and Australia have, well, more accurately, Australia, more specifically, Australia has a closer tie to Melanesia, New Zealand to Polynesia. So, you know, what they don't want is 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 an interaction where where um, we kind of pick and choose in the Pacific Islands. They want a they want to interact with all of us on a multilateral, bilateral uh, uh, relationship, and not uh, and not in a in in some sense that you know, hey, you take, you know, you. You know, you you're primarily responsible for interacting and helping uh, in in uh, in in Micronesia, and, and we'll you know we'll talk somewhere else. That's that's not that's not from from their perspective, uh, and I agree with them. That's not the right way to do it. So we've kind of got to we have to very closely coordinate, and I think we've done a good job. So a lot of credit again to those countries. Uh, um, they're actually carrying, uh, relatively speaking, a much heavier load uh, than than we are in the Pacific Islands. So let's let's go to the topic of China, which has, you know, obviously the whole discussion with China has changed substantially over the last several years. Um, China clearly has a lot of influence in the region, and many uh, of the Pacific Island nations uh, look to China as a as a friend, as a source of development and investment. Um, how how do you see the U.S. Competing with China, how, how does that relationship uh, uh, go forward and not put the Pacific Island nations in a in a really tough uh, place in the middle? Well, of course, this is a much 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 bigger um, um, discussion than you know any one country or any one of the Pacific Islands or them collectively, or for that matter, any of the rest of the world. The the issue is is relatively and roughly the same um, as to our relationship with uh, China. If you talk about, you know, Africa, for example, or South America or Latin America, um, the, the same basic discussion is, is going to occur. China is interested in, in expanding its power and influence and is, is, is using every tool in its toolkit uh, to do that, uh, whether it be whether it be you know economic uh, uh, development, uh, whether it be, um, uh, you know, major infrastructure, um, whether it be um, very straight military expansion, uh, they're, they're, they've got you know a little bit of a velvet glove on it, but they're doing it nonetheless. Um, and so their goal is to is to expand their power and influence and control. Um, that's that's China's announced goal. Uh, so um, do we think that's a good idea? No, we don't. We we have no problem with with a with a growing China. We have we have no problem with a China that takes its place in the world. We would really like it, um, obviously, if China would would um, view it as in their best interest to to um, uh, participate in a in a in a regional world um, or not regional, but uh, a world order uh, that respected the rule of law, that understood uh, a country's uh, desires to maintain sovereignty, that respected basic democratic values. Um, so the 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 
forks in the road that we face with China over the next 10 or 20 years are going to influence every part of the world. And the Pacific Islands are at the forefront of that because China is directly interested in expanding its power and influence. Uh, and I would submit creating dependence uh, in the Pacific Islands. And I don't think that comes uh, out of any sense of, of humanitarian concern for the Pacific Islands. I think it comes out of a sense of competition with the United States. Um, so I'm, I'm, I think I'm pretty clear in terms of my understanding of what China is trying to accomplish. Now that puts the Pacific Islands in a terrible position because if what they really need is the United States saying, talking less about um, you know uh, democracy and, and uh, how, how good we are and more about helping them with economic development, but China is offering that economic development, that forces them to a very difficult choice because I think that they prefer uh, to have that partnership in future uh, with um, uh, the United States and our friends and allies. <clears throat> I think that's more cons far more consistent with uh, their values. Uh, I think that's far more consistent with where they want the future of their countries to go. But if we are gonna ignore uh, the need, their needs for infrastructure and economic development, which is number one, number one to them, along with ch climate change, and China offers that, then that puts them to a terrible choice. And we have to be very, very realist realistic about that. Uh, in many parts of the, the Pacific, um, you know, to include some of our friends and allies like Australia, where China is our largest trading partner, at least um, so far, uh, but their alliances are with the United States. That's a that's a difficult tightrope to walk. Australia is big enough to walk walk that tightrope. It's a lot more difficult for a small country um, that has very very limited resources to do that. So the bottom line is, um, you know, you've 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 got to you've got to not only engage the Pacific Islands, but understand exactly what their needs are and and ask how can you help. And that's what we're doing in the Blue Pacific Bill. Is okay, fine. You're telling us that you need these things. Here it is. And I want to ask you one more follow-up question on that, but also uh, remind our viewers that if you have a question, you go to the chat box uh, on the YouTube page. We're starting to get a number of questions in. I'll turn to them in a moment. But just to follow up on that, Congressman Case, do, is there much interest from U.S. Uh, private sector to invest um, in the Pacific Islands region? And, uh, you know, in addition to economic assistance and military aid, um, are you finding it difficult to entice businesses to invest in that area? Um, you know, well, first of all, I haven't really been far down that road yet in terms of the private sector, but we're, we're clearly in our country trying to incentivize that development through the Development Finance Corp, ARIA. ARIA. Um, these, are, these were major initiatives by the United States uh, to, to um, up our game. Uh, in the world from an economic participation and infrastructure development perspective and, and recognizing the reality that uh, um, China offering uh, in, in, the, in these areas was again creating this very, very difficult choice and it was creating um, leverage, uh, which China has no problem in exercising in the United Nations and, and elsewhere to its own, to its own gains. Mm -hmm. And so um, whether it be uh, infrastructure or economic USAID assistance or incentivizing our private sector to participate uh, in the Pacific Islands, we've got to kind of do all of the above. I think that there are, um, there are uh, almost by definition, uh, some limitations on what kind of economic development the private sector would participate in in the Pacific Islands, but they certainly would participate in infrastructure development. They certainly would participate in in in, uh, in in sustainable tourism. I think that they would certainly participate in, in uh, um, sustainable energy uh, uh, development and administration. Uh, so there are, you know, there are there are definitely areas for the private sector to participate in. Uh, responsible, sustainable uh, fisheries um, be one of them, and that's a that's a really critical um, issue to many of the Pacific Islands who have uh, uh, plentiful fisheries, uh, but they. Okay, well, as I mentioned earlier, I think Indo-PACOM has done some of the best uh, work in the Pacific Islands. Um, I think what the U.S. military understands is, is that, um, that our country needs to engage across the board with the Pacific Islands. Um, so the U.S. Uh, uh, military through, through Indo-PACOM, um, but not just Indo-PACOM, but that's where the focus is because that's their area of um, yeah. our own internal jurisdiction. <clears throat> I think that, I think that, from a from a from a defense posture for our country, uh, what the U.S. military um, is trying to accomplish is that 
our potential adversaries, primarily China, do not gain a foothold uh, in the Pacific where they can, uh, which they can utilize as a as a um, a base from which to um, threaten our na na national defenses, and more importantly, and this is part of our our announced. Um, international uh, strategy, which I agree with, and that is to maintain a free and open Indo-Pacific. In other words, um, there is freedom to transit the Indo-Pacific uh, for, for trade and for other purposes. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, we, we see, for example, in spades, uh, China, uh, China's effort in the South China Sea, if you want to look at evidence of kind of where China, what, what China's game plan is in terms of in terms of influencing uh, some of the Pacific Islands, um, then look at the South China Sea for the goal. The goal in the South China Sea is to assert sovereignty over the South, South China Sea and influence free and free and uh, free and open Indo-Pacific. That being one of the major um, sea lanes in the entire uh, country. So use that as a model. Uh, China would use the same model out of the Pacific Islands, and that would be detrimental not only to the Pacific Islands uh, but to our uh, national defense and to our allies as well. And so the, the military, from a, mili from a purely military perspective, um, that would be um, a principal goal, which would, would be to deny China the ability to do that because in our long-term interests, that's, that's not a good thing. Um, but the military then has, has uh, a clear um, sense that if we, are only, if we are only interacting with the Pacific Islands for this purpose, if that's our only reason to be there, that's not a good enough reason. It's not a good enough reason for our country, and it's certainly not a good enough reason for for the for the Pacific Islands because they don't want to be a pawn in a big old military, uh, you know, uh, chess game. Who does? And so um, I think that our our Indo-PACOM uh, recognizes uh, in in you know crystal clear um, that although we do have national security uh concerns in the pacific islands that cannot be exclusive and we cannot simply you know assert our power there uh and expect everything to be okay that this has to this has to be paired uh with with a very strong uh, non-military uh engagement the pacific islands uh, what if you want to call it soft power you can uh but i i don't particularly like that term in this in this context i i think engagement is far better that we recognize their needs and recognize our needs and see if we can um, have a mutual set of needs in, in interaction with our allies and partners around the Pacific Rim and the Pacific Islands themselves, uh, whether those needs are uh, economic, uh, which is the primary need, or assistance with climate change, which they themselves uh, have said uh, collectively is their number one threat, the ex existential threat of rising sea level and climate change. Uh, to again uh, uh, maintaining the sovereignty of of their countries uh, uh, to include primarily their exclusive economic zone. The, the the U.S. military is very cognizant of that, and they have uh, been very supportive uh, for that reason of of the um, development of the uh, Blue Pacific Act. So they're they're they've been in, involved in our discussions, and um, they've said this is what we think you should do on the non-military side. Well, here's what might be a good follow-on question. We clearly have some, some very informed viewers. Uh, the question is, with the compacts for the Federated States of Micronesia and the Republic of the Marshall Islands being renegotiated, how does Congress balance the need to support allies without creating dependence? And what's the outlook for renewing these compacts expeditiously? And maybe for those those of us who are less familiar with these compacts, you can say a word as to what they are and why they matter. Sure. Okay, so um, so the compacts of free association are um, agreements with the independent countries of the Federated States of Micronesia, with the Republic of the Marshall Islands and the Republic of Palau. Uh, the, the, two separate uh, compacts. Yeah, two separate compacts, three countries. Uh, the the um, these were these were countries that were under trust administration after the Second World uh, War through the United Nations and and uh, became their own independent countries and uh, chose uh, together with the United States to enter into free association with the United States, uh, uh, which um, essentially um, 
what it comes down to at the end is an agreement under which uh, the United States would be responsible for um, their defense and for um, the, the, the um, uh, uh, well, for their defense. Uh, and uh, in return, uh, the um, compact countries uh, were entitled to compact payments from the United States, which were to uh, build up a corpus over time with which, which they could draw upon uh, for sustainable uh, economic support and development. Um, um, and um, also that their um, citizens would be entitled uh, to come to the United States uh, to live and work um, without being citizens per se, uh, but without restriction. And so that has been going on for decades now. And these compacts come up for uh, um, um, uh, renegotiation every 20 years. Is it? Um, I think it's 20 years. And they are up now. Uh, one of them has already been renegotiated. And now we've got the next one, which is under negotiation right now. I think these compacts are critical to our country. Um, it is critical for us to maintain uh, the relationship with, with these countries. I believe that uh, both the United States and these countries uh, would, would say that the compacts have been uh, critical to both sides for that relationship. And by the way, not just not just the compact countries. I think they've been critical to the Pacific Islands and to our engagement in the Pacific Islands because it is a very demonstrated, uh, you know, partnership between us and those those countries um, that has also benefited other Pacific Islands. Um, there are uh, clearly issues uh, with the compacts that need to be worked out in a renegotiation. Uh, the corpus that we've we had hoped to you know build up over time has has not. And so they've they've been um, you know the the compact monies have been have been used uh, more for operating expenses as opposed to being built up immediate operating expenses as opposed to being built up in mm -hmm. in a corpus uh, that's been a function of of, of of difficulties in sustainable economic development but there's nothing there that uh, um, can't be worked out uh, there's nothing there that um, uh, would 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 call into question the basic agreement that we have and, and continuing that agreement. So to answer your question, I think they're of critical importance to both all of us and to the Pacific Islands and our engagement in the Pacific Islands, um, number one. And number two, um, I'm not sure I can say expeditiously in the sense of, you know, six months from now we'll be done with it. I don't think that's going to be quite that. These things, you know, people have to kind of go through a process, right? And I think that we're going to have to take a little bit of time to get through that process, but um, they're supposed to be done within a couple of years. So it's not like they're going to drag on. I know the last one did, uh, but uh, nobody wants that to happen again. Nobody wants to get into a situation where we're operating on, a, on an expired compact. Um, here's a question that follows you on uh, the several mentions that you've made of climate change being perhaps the number one concern of the Pacific Island nations. And the question is, is the receptivity in Congress uh, to the concern around climate change uh, among these Pacific Island nations? You know, I've got to say that uh, in all honesty, I don't think Congress as, a, as an institution um, in general understands the impact of climate change on island nations around the world. Um, uh, but especially in the Pacific. Um, you know, in, in Congress, we come from many different places, and most of those places are uh, not by the seashore, and um, perhaps they're at elevation. Um, so uh, people do not tend to focus on the plight of a Pacific Island nation that, um, whose, whose, whose maximum elevation is 10 or 20 or 30 feet. Uh, whose who, who's, uh, population uh, has lived at the shoreline for generations, forever. Uh, and that shoreline has now disappeared uh, where you lived for generations with your family. Um, it's gone um, and it's not stopping. And, and, and that, I don't think people fully appreciate the existential threat that that presents uh, to um, these nations whose international airport may be falling into the ocean um, and, and who, who doesn't really have a good solid alternative. And so <clears throat> I've got to say that, you know, one of the challenges here is to highlight, highlight why when the Pacific Islands Forum and other Pacific uh, uh, Islands or organizations say that this is their number one issue, their number one threat, their number one concern, why that is so true. 
Um, and we see the Pacific Islands um, um, beating in this area in the world. Uh, they have led at the United Nations, for example, uh, in terms of trying to highlight the crisis of, of climate change. They have led in terms of, of, of urging the United States to stay in the Paris agreements and, and, to, and to engage with the world. Um, by the way, they should say the same thing to China, which is you know, our, our partner in, in number one carbon emissions uh, uh, mm -hmm. in the world. So um, I think that they have led not only out of necessity, but with great you know, moral, moral authority on this subject. And I think, I think that um, uh, our challenge is, is, is to listen um, and to take heed because as they go, so do, so do you know, not, not just them, which is, criti which is a crit critical issue for us, in, in the in the in the in the um, totality of the world, but um, it also indicates what um, is is in store for parts of our country as well. Uh, in Hawaii, we're dealing with climate change. We're an island nation. We happen to be more mountainous than many of the Pacific islands, so we can go upland a little bit. But our shorelines are eroding. Florida, same thing. Um, you know, throughout our country. So um, I think we ought to listen to the Pacific Islands a little bit more in this area. Um, we have another question that says uh, a former delegate from Guam, Bob Underwood, once told them uh, that he had never had a member of Congress, a fellow member of Congress, express an interest in the islands, obviously before you arrived, uh, Congressman Case. On this point, could you share how delegates from the U.S. Pacific Island territories contribute to the conversation in Congress? Well, I mean, um, being from Hawaii, um, which, um, you know, which, which, when you're a representative or a senator from Hawaii, you, you also represent the Pacific. So you do, you do encompass within your, your kuleana, as we say in Hawaii, your responsibility. Um, the responsibility of understanding and assisting uh, with, with um, uh, in particular, um, our, 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 our brothers and sisters in the Pacific, so American Samoa, uh, Guam, and the uh, Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands, um, all of which I have been to. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, and I have, I have, I have talked to um, 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 my 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 fellow delegates, um, both previously in my prior service in Congress as well as um, uh, uh, currently uh, on their issues. So we do talk, we do try to help each other on these issues. Uh, one of our issues, for example, especially for Guam and the CNMI and and uh, Hawaii, is uh, um, that although we support the compacts, um, the um, the citizens of those countries that come to the United States to live and work uh, uh, have many needs from education to health, et cetera. And they live primarily in Guam and Hawaii. We have the largest populations, yet we are not compensated by the United States for that, or at least we are very, very minimally. Uh, so for me, that's a major issue from a compact negotiation. Mm -hmm. I clearly discuss that on a regular basis with, uh, you know, you know, Mr. San Nicolas and Mr. Sablan, uh, we try to help very much with economic development um, uh, for American Samoa uh, probably has one of the most difficult situations because because their 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 fishing, which has supported um, them, them for a very long time, is 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 problematic now because of over overfishing. CNMI in Guam heavily reliant on tourism, tourism heavily impacted by COVID-19. So they have critical challenges as is true of the, all of the Pacific islands because of COVID-19. These are countries, by the way, that we, we, we fail to recognize have done some of the best work in the entire world on COVID-19. They have very, very low rates from a public health perspective, but they did it by, by the extreme uh, move of shutting themselves down. And if you're dependent on tourism and interaction to that extent, that's gonna really hurt your economy. So they need immediate help. And we've, been, we've provided that uh, in our emergency assistance in Congress through the CARES Act and the HEROES Act, which is um, the, the second wave of emergency assistance um, that we hope to pass in the next 10 days, literally. Uh, some of that money is allocated clearly to assisting our, our um, partners in the Pacific. But to your point, um, it is very much a, a, a collaborative uh, relationship. Um, uh, Congress, Congressman Underwood was a, a great representative of Guam. He's missed. Uh, 
Um, and I think his his assessment, because he served for a long time and he and he and he has a good sense of the institution, his assessment was accurate. But again, I would say we're trying to change that. And and I go yeah. back to my earlier comment, which is you you know you you, you just show up a little bit more. One of the things that COVID nineteen did, by the way, is to cancel um, a a I think probably first ever congressional delegation uh, to the Pacific Islands, which uh, mm -hmm. we had arranged for later this year, where we meant to take the members of the caucus and, and colleagues uh, uh, to, to many parts of the Pacific to engage personally as members of Congress uh, with the full cooperation of, of our uh, Department of Defense and Departments of State. So they were very, very excited for us to do that because that hasn't happened really. Um, so we're going to have to pick that up as soon as we get through COVID-19, but we look forward to doing that. Then, then, then nobody can represent that. Uh, you know, no member of Congress has ever been to, you know, whatever it might be. Well, probably a great number of them have been there uh, for those who were Peace Corps volunteers. As you've noted, that seems to be a primary way that Americans, other than Hawaiians, engage with that part of the world. I mean, there's a whole there's a there's a whole alumni group of Peace Corps volunteers out there from through the generations that served uh, in the Pacific Islands, and who are familiar with them, passionate about the Pacific Islands. Many of them actually have stayed mm -hmm. in the Pacific Islands. Uh, yeah. I know folks, for example, in Palau who have who, who went out there as Peace Corps volunteers and are still there. Uh, certainly, that's true um, in Hawaii. And I would say also the other area that that and I I made quick mention of it uh, earlier. The other area of, of significant interaction uh, with the Pacific Islands and our country is still in, in the religion area uh, where um, there are, there are um, uh, religions, uh, uh, the, the um, uh, Mormons, for example, very active uh, in the Pacific Islands uh, and very interactive uh, back with the United States uh, in, in Hawaii in particular. So there are, there are, there are um, you know, webs of connections to the Pacific Islands that have been created over the generations uh, that we can 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 tap into and really re-energize uh, uh, for our overall engagement. So one final question, and then uh, I understand that um, Congressman Yoho may join us for a quick cameo before we close out, um, but I will ask you in the meantime, and because uh, we have a number of questions stacked up, and that is how does the Blue Pacific Act align with and differ from efforts underway in the House Armed Services Committee and the Senate Armed Services Committee, such as the Pacific Deterrence Initiative and the Indo-Pacific Reassurance Initiative? Clearly um, very knowledgeable viewers here. It's completely coordinated. Um, first of all, uh, many of those provisions in both the NDAA um, and um, in the um, appropriations bills. So uh, for that very knowledgeable viewer, uh, check out not just the NDAA, uh, but go check out uh, state and foreign ops approps and also check out uh, defense approps. Uh, and you will see in their uh, coordination uh, between uh, NDAA and the approps side of things in terms of the Indo-Pacific Initiative, in terms of uh, outreach on areas such as, again, I mentioned the Coast Guard, uh, many of those uh, provisions were advocated by me and other members of the Pacific uh, Caucus. So this was with malice of forethought, uh, and um, <laughs> we're, 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 we're not just um, you know we're not just um, in introducing the Blue Pacific Act and calling it a day. We're also working uh, in the defense authorization, in the non-defense authorization, and for for me personally, uh, because I'm a member of that committee, in appropriations itself to 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 fund. Um, um, these initiatives. So from my perspective, um, um, if we can achieve a, a, an, a, a, a big Congress approach uh, to the Pacific Islands through the Pacific Islands Caucus, both officially and unofficially, because uh, members of the um, Pacific Islands, uh, I'm going to stop right now because Ted has joined us and we're running out of time. Anyway, if we can do that, and I think we are doing that, it's going to be a very successful effort. Wonderful. Thank you. And welcome, Congressman Yoho. Uh, we understand you were delayed, but delightful, delighted that you're able to join us for the last few moments. I we am too. A conversation and you've been introduced. So I'd like to just turn it over to you if you'd like to make some comments on this. I'll just make some brief comments because I know this is at the close and I do apologize for being late. And uh, 
my good friend Ed Case, I know, covered the issues. He and I are pretty well aligned in this, and I can't thank him enough for his leadership and stress the importance of that whole Pacific Island region. Uh, it's critical for all of us, us being a, a, a Pacific Island nation. We know the importance of that. And I don't want to focus just on military and defense of things like that. You know, we need to go beyond that. And the way we go beyond that is economies. And what we passed last Congress with the Development Finance Corporation, uh, this is something that we are serious about. The money's been appropriated. And this is something that we look forward to going into a country or we can go into a region and we can partner up with other DFCs, whether it's Canada, the UK, Japan, Australia, any country that has a DFC and make a significant impact in that country for the benefit of that country and develop the kind of economy they want so that out of that economy, those investments come in, jobs are created, so you increase the life, uh, lifestyle of the people in those regions. And by doing that, trade happens and we become good trading partners. And if we do that, the world will be safer and national security will be stronger. And um, I know America's got a lot of faults, but the one thing we can do is we can invest in uh, our, our rule of law as far as businesses and things like that and honoring contracts and pledges, we will do that. And I hope the people on this call understand that and I look forward to working with you. And again, I, I appreciate Chairman Case for putting this together. He is a great leader in this and I look forward to working with him. Thank you for letting me come in at the very end. Well, thank you for joining us. And uh, we did talk a little earlier, uh, Congressman Case talked about the Development Finance Corporation, which of course you were a good. He did a good champion job. of. I did it up for you. Yeah. Um, one of the things I encourage people out from the, those nations is reach out to Adam Bowler at DFC. He's the CEO. I mean, there's some incredible things that we're looking to do. And one of the big things, too, is to remove uh, or secure supply chains and get them redistributed redistrib around the world from APIs. We've got new technology and handling waste uh, where you can go from waste to synthetic gas to methanol. And uh, feel free to reach out to our office. I'm passionate about this and look forward to building strong economies. Um, thank you. Great. Thank you for, for joining us. I know you've had a busy morning, uh, but we appreciate your joining us. Congressman Case, any final words before we close up here? Well, I think um, I, we, we, again, just really appreciate USIP uh, sponsoring us. I'm, I'm really honored uh, to, be, to be a part of this with uh, Ted Yoho, who's been really, really critical uh, to the East, East Asia and the Pacific, uh, takes a passionate uh, a view of it. I think he's exactly right. We've talked uh, at length um, uh, before he arrived on, on the importance of our economic outreach, our economic development, our economic support. Uh, uh, that's what is critical uh, to the Pacific Islands. And um, if we don't deliver uh, in that area, uh, then um, the rest of it is, is not going to uh, you know, mean a lot uh, because um, we have to understand what uh, our mutual needs are again. And, and if we can get into a relationship of, of truly listening to and helping each other and re-engaging from that perspective, uh, I think um, the, the future is uh, quite, um, quite good. Uh, for for the for for our country uh, and our world's uh, re-engagement and and uh, increased engagement with the Pacific Islands. Uh, so, you know, the opportunity to highlight my backyard is always wonderful. But the um, the um, passion that Ted brings to that uh, being being uh, living on the Atlantic side of the country, I think, is 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 truly um, remarkable from my perspective. So I'm I'm just really. I really appreciate uh, uh, serving with him and, and his service, especially on foreign affairs. Thank you. Congressman Yoho, you of course have been a vigorous champion for more effective global engagement. And so this is well within the legacy that you leave. Um, any final words you'd like to make as we close out? You know, we've been blessed in this country um, with the phrase, the American dream. My wife and I are products of that. Um, you know, without a long, boring story, you know, my house, my parents got divorced at 13. My house got repossessed at 15. I was out on my own at 18. My wife was out on her own at 16. We started from zero and we worked and we were able to achieve by getting a good education that we paid for. But it was the opportunity 
that led to us in a system that protects your rights as a, as a citizen. And if that can happen for us, it can happen for any country around the world. It can be the plow dream, it can be the Toto dream. I mean, there's so many places that it's not unique to, it is unique to America, but any country can accomplish that if they have rule of law and opportunity. And that's what we want to extend so that you can be successful in your country and that next generation will have something to look forward to and build to make the world a better place. And uh, again, you know, I just got the utmost respect for your organization, for Ed Case and the leadership he has. Uh, and we will do whatever I can with my remaining time in Congress to help any of these countries that reach out to us. You know, and if we can formulate a game plan of what's best, what do you need in your country, let's get to work and uh, let's look at the results. Wonderful. Well, I want to thank both of you again for joining us. Uh, thank you for the master class we just had on the Pacific Islands. Uh, congratulations to both of you for forming an important new caucus. Uh, yeah. It's already having a significant impact. And I want to thank all of our viewers for joining us. And please tune in again uh, for our next bipartisan congressional dialogue series. Uh, thank you both. Have a, have a wonderful day. Thank you. Aloha. Bye-bye. See you, <laughs> <laughs>